Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Hey guys, we're your hosts, M and J. Today the two of us are talking about a problem in modern comics that in our opinion is holding the whole industry back. It seems to us that a lot of comic book writers don't actually want to write superhero stories. I know that's a pretty big claim, but looking at these comics, what other conclusion can we come to? It seems like a lot of these writers are more interested in giving their political commentary rather than writing a fun story with superheroes. Superheroes. For example, we reviewed Harley Quinn number 56, and in that book, they tried to use animal rescue as a thinly veiled allegory for the comic book industry, but in doing so, they completely misrepresented animal rescue, and honestly, the comic book industry too. They kind of just made up whatever they wanted about animal rescue and the comic book industry to fit their agenda, rather than looking at animal rescue and the comic book industry for what they are, and ultimately, that that's why their satire failed. Satire has to be rooted in reality in order to work, but if you just make up whatever you want, there's no way it can work. We didn't know this when we reviewed the first issue of the Wonder Twins comic, but the writer of this book is actually the same writer as Harley Quinn number 56, Mark Russell, which explains a lot. This writer is clearly more interested in writing about politics than he is in writing superhero stories, but if you're going to work for a big company that's known for for their superhero stories and has been known for these specific stories for decades, you've really got to get that superhero structure down. I wish DC would stick up for their characters more, cause it looks bad for the company. Sometimes when these points are brought up, people get defensive and say that, oh these are just comic books and they don't have to be realistic, and they're just jokes so you shouldn't take them so seriously. But the problem with that argument is that when the writer is trying to make political arguments about issues that are based in reality and issues that we do face as a society, then the work has to have some kind of realism to it. Otherwise, the argument totally fails. Ultimately, these books don't end up being constructive or really add a lot to the conversation because they end up being very destructive in the way they present their arguments. Maybe it would be best for some of these writers to not write superhero stories and instead write what they actually actually want to write political commentary essays or satire because these stories are really suffering thanks to their writer's activism. We see these problems with issue 2 of the Wonder Twins. This story focuses so much on the political commentary, in this case being prison reform, that basic story structure gets thrown out the window. Things aren't set up properly, everything's very convenient to service the plot, characters end up where they need to, not because they made a choice to go there, but because they were pushed there by the plot demanding it. It results in a very messy narrative that's just not entertaining. You can see this from the cover of this book. It's actually a standard superhero cover. You have the heroes towards the bottom looking very small in comparison to the villains who take up much more space and are towering over them. This makes it look like the heroes are at a disadvantage and they're gonna have to struggle against these villains. But then Beast Boy is in the bottom corner asking, what is going on in this book? Beast Boy, what are you doing? This is a pretty standard superhero cover. Why are you asking this question as if anything's out of the ordinary? It kind of shows that they think that this book is so very different from any other superhero book, but actually it's mostly standard. This is what happens when people put a political agenda over story. They make it out to be strange when heroes fight villains. Also, it's kind of strange that they included Beast Boy on the cover as a guest star, because because that kind of implies that he's going to be teaming up with the twins or something along those lines. But in reality, despite the fact that he's in the book, he doesn't really have that much bearing on the plot. Superman is also in the book, yet he's not featured on the cover as a guest star. Plus, Beast Boy's role in the story could have been filled by any character. But the book officially opens on a villain called the Scrambler who's in jail. He has the ability to switch bodies of people who get too close to him. Despite the fact that we spend the first three pages of the comic with him, he's not actually the main villain, which was surprising. They should have spent this time setting up the actual villain. The Scrambler actually has a lot of potential to be an interesting character, but unfortunately he's not allowed to live up to that potential. He has a motivation, he thinks the justice system is unjust, so he's gonna take matters into his own hands. That's a pretty classic villain motivation, of wanting to tear down society and remake it in their own image. Instead he's reduced 
to just a joke. His costume is bright orange with the symbol of a fried egg on it, and it's disappointing because his abilities can actually cause a lot of chaos and be really interesting to explore, but instead he's just this one note joke. The Scrambler uses his powers to escape prison. In the meantime, the Wonder Twins are on a school bus getting ready to go to the planetarium on a field trip with the Honors Club. I'm surprised Zan's in the Honors Club. But they find out right then that they can't go to the planetarium because of budget cuts? Wouldn't they have known that before they got on the bus? Why are they just telling the students now? The teacher says he has good news and that they can still go on a field trip because they found somewhere else that'll take them for free. But shouldn't they get a parent's permission slip to do that? I mean, if you told all the parents they were going to the planetarium, but you take them somewhere else, wouldn't the school get in trouble for that? That's not how school field trips work. But it turns out they're taking them to the same prison where the Scrambler escaped. Personally, I don't understand how a prison is any substitution for the planetarium. What can you learn at the prison that they could have learned at the planetarium? It seems like that time would have been better spent if they just stayed in class and studied astronomy. The thing is, this comic is about prison reform, not about telling a story. So really, the writer just needs the main characters to go to a prison in order for Jaina to decide that she's against the prison system. So he just has some arbitrary excuse for them to go, even if it doesn't make any sense. This plot probably could have worked if it had been given more thought. It seems like this story is just a first draft that never went through any edits. But if they had visited the prison for a better reason than just they couldn't go to the planetarium and have the Scrambler escape while they're there instead of before they arrived, then the two of them could have tracked him down and still had this anti-prison message while still serving the story in a more constructive way than just having one silly and contrived coincidence after another. So the kids are touring the prison and this is where a lot of the activism rhetoric comes into the story. This prison is operating a call center and they're using prisoners to answer the phones. They say this is to rehabilitate them. Jaina asks how and the tour guide says that they're learning valuable skills that they'll use once they get out of prison. She also says 9 out of 10 inmates who receive vocational training in prison don't reoffend. I tried looking this figure up and I couldn't find it, but I did find that it does reduce the likelihood of reoffending. Jaina makes a comment that that basically means 90% of the people who are here don't need to be, and that gets them kicked out. So there's a lot to unpack from this scene. First of all, in the previous issue, they kept insisting that Jaina is a shy character, but at no point is she actually portrayed as being shy. And here's a really good example of her not being shy at all. She's actually very outgoing and outspoken. Someone who's shy often tries to avoid attention, even if it's positive. She would most likely just try to hide in the crowd. And someone who's shy would definitely not say something controversial directly to an authority figure. In this case, challenging the prison tour guide. Her characterization is completely wrong. If they had just set her up as a very passionate and outspoken person to begin with, there wouldn't be an issue. But don't keep trying to tell us that she's shy. But when it comes to the activism of this book, I'm not sure if it's as clear as the writer wants it to be. What exactly is he arguing? Is he saying that we should work to keep people out of prison in the first place? Or is he saying that we should forget about prisons and instead use rehabilitation or something along those lines? Jaina keeps denouncing the work that Lexicon is doing to rehabilitate the prisoners. But according to the statistic that the tour guide has, this vocational training is actually really effective and is basically proving that what the prisons are doing is beneficial to their inmates. And she doesn't do a good job at explaining her actual issue with it. Is she saying that the prisoners are being taken advantage of because they're not paid enough? Or is it that prisons shouldn't have vocational training at all? Because if that statistic is true, and again, I couldn't find it, but maybe a quick Google search isn't enough, that is a great number. But I'm also not sure we're meant to believe this woman, just based on the way it's written. Like, the actual villain of this story is the prison system, and not necessarily the villains. So I guess this lady is also a bad guy? That is a really impressive figure, though, assuming it's true. After the field trip, Superman introduces them to Beast Boy, another teen changeling hero. He's wrapping up a TV commercial and Superman 
Thomas says that the twins can be in his place one day if they continue to do good work, much to Zan's delight and Jaina's dismay. But it cuts back to the Scrambler who contacts Lex Luthor, asking about the next Legion of Doom meeting, but Lex informs him that he's already been replaced on the Legion. The Scrambler protests this, saying that he was supposed to have a seat on the board for another year, so Lex instead moves him to another team under the same organization called the League of Annoyance. Meanwhile, Beast Boy shows them records of the villains that were recently captured by the Justice League. Jaina asks what happens to them after they're captured, and Beast Boy says they usually end up in jail. And if they reoffend, the heroes have to go after them again. Jaina isn't convinced by these methods, and Beast Boy asks what they do on Exor. They say that there are no prisons on Exor, but also we know that they don't know everything about Exor. They don't even know they've been banished from the planet. For all we know, the twins are just very sheltered. We know from other Wonder Twins comics that Exor wasn't exactly a utopia. It had a lot of problems. This is a different continuity, so it is possible that this Exor is different from what we know. But the Wonder Twins probably aren't the best source to tell us about Exor. Beast Boy tells them to give it a shot, and their first assignment as superheroes is to go after the League of Annoyance. It's kind of surprising that they'd be given field work since they are just interns. You'd think they'd be training right now or something like that, but I guess the League of Annoyance isn't actually meant to be a threat anyway. They're just a bunch of joke villains. So we finally get introduced to the League of Annoyance. These are all original characters, which wouldn't be an issue if they were actually allowed to be characters and not just jokes. There's a difference between a comedic villain and being the butt of a joke, but we also think that this was a missed opportunity to use more obscure villains, considering the fact that the Wonder Twins are obscure heroes. This is also where it randomly switches from following Scrambler as the main villain into following Baron Nightblood, which for storytelling purposes was not a good idea. It should have either stuck with the Scrambler as the main villain or focused on Baron Nightblood to begin with. The villains go over their evil plans. One of the members is a vampire called Baron Nightblood, but they also call him Drunkula, although he hates that. Apparently he's a vampire who has a problem drinking blood of people who have drank alcohol, and that makes him drunk, hence Drunkula. But he says he's trying to go sober, and his plan is to just troll the Justice League on social media. But the other members typecast him as a vampire because he is a vampire, and they say that he should just do vampire things. So the Baron just goes along with it. Back at the Hall of Justice, Jaina is still upset about the whole prison thing. Zan says they should just give it a chance since it seems Earth has gotten along fine up until now. Jaina asks if he's taken a history class, and Zan apparently dropped history class for dance class. Wouldn't history be a requirement though? How is he going to graduate? Jazz dance does not fill history requirement. But Zan is too busy reading his comic book and gets distracted by an advertisement for what basically amounts to Gleek. The computer alerts them that Drunkula is on the move, and he's about to attack two people. I do like that in this issue, the twins actually get to fight villains, cause last issue we didn't get to see any of that. But then the issue shames them for it, so I guess you win some, you lose a lot. But Zan fights Baron Nightblood, and it's revealed that the twins can use their powers at will without having to fist bump to activate their powers. The Baron starts lecturing about how heroes and villains are all the same. He says that the heroes wouldn't know what to do with themselves if the villains went straight. He says he finally felt like he had the freedom to choose his own path for the first time in centuries, but the path you chose was the League of Annoyance? Yeah, that's on you, buddy. They're the ones who peer pressured you into being a vampire, and then instead of the Baron standing up for himself, he just gave in to it. He could have just stayed home and harassed the Justice League on social media like he wanted to, and now he's just blaming Zan because Zan happened to be there. He's like one of those people that refuses to take responsibility for his own actions and instead blames everyone else around him. He was about to attack two people. What were they supposed to do? Just let him? He also says that Zan isn't strong enough to defeat him, which Zan agrees with, but he says that he brought his sister for that purpose. So then Jaina comes out of nowhere as a gorilla and punches him. This was a huge missed opportunity. She could have turned into a werewolf, but instead she turns into a basic gorilla. Vampires versus werewolves is classic. Also, can a gorilla actually defeat a vampire? I mean, don't vampires have super strength and agility and can technically only be taken down by exploiting one of their weaknesses? 
is, when instead Jaina just punches him as a gorilla and he's down. I actually think Xan would have been a better matchup against a vampire than a gorilla. He could turn into steam and burn him and then restrain him while he's recovering. Or he could just turn into water and trap him like that. It just seems like there were a lot of options here. They feel weird about it, but honestly I don't feel sorry for this guy. If he's going to attack people, they have to do something about it, and he has to face the consequences for his actions. They take him to a prison, but apparently it's full because there was a hockey game, so the guy there suggests they take him to a private holding center, which ends up being Lexicon. I'm surprised they didn't go there in the first place because the story had already set up Lexicon. Meanwhile, Lexicon is also full. I'm sure this is supposed to be commentary on overcrowding in prisons, which wouldn't have been an issue if the writer had used any kind of nuance or respect for the issue instead of these really cringy jokes. But they take him anyway, even though they don't know what to do with him. Baron Nightblood is a vampire, so maybe it's not the best idea to just put him in prison anyway? Doesn't the Justice League have somewhere to put super-powered villains? Maybe? Would a normal facility even be able to handle a super-powered mythical being? There are just so many better ways, even in the world that they set up here, to handle this situation. But the writer just has to make a point about the prison industrial complex that he's completely ignoring obvious solutions. This is what happens when agenda comes before storytelling. He also has to make everyone involved in the comic a complete moron. That's the only way this could play out the way the writer wants it to. The twins go back to the Hall of Justice and Beast Boy brings in a package for Xan, which turns out to be Gleek. He doesn't get to do anything in this issue, he's just introduced in this one panel. Jaina still insists that she's not sure about this whole prison system, and it's also officially revealed that Lexicon is owned by Lex Luthor, makes sense based off of the name, but at the same time, if they know this prison is owned by Lex Luthor, then why are they storing villains there? I'm surprised they would trust him enough to work with him by leaving dangerous villains technically in his care. Also, if the Scrambler had a board seat on the Legion of Doom, then why didn't Lex Luthor just get him out of Lexicon when he was brought in? He's a super villain who owns a private prison. I'm sure he could pull some strings. Jaina asks if superheroes are just the human resource department of a telemarketing scam, and Beast Boy says that they have to work within the world they live in, but they do have other options. They're just being conveniently ignored for this story. The twins get a call that they can pick up Baron Nightblood. I guess this was a temporary holding facility. It turns out they didn't have enough room, so they just threw him in the drunk tank. Because what else are you expecting at this point? So we cut to Baron Nightblood who has killed everyone in the drunk tank, and he's upset because he was 30 days sober. Don't people turn into vampires when they get bitten by a vampire? I guess it depends on the continuity. So that's the comic. It's a mess. The writer is really focused on his agenda, but he's also stuck writing this superhero story. So the story ends up distracting from the agenda, and the agenda distracts from the story. Neither ends up working. Baron Nightblood is supposed to be a sympathetic villain, but honestly, he doesn't really have anyone to blame but himself. He's the one who chose to join the League of Annoyance and be a supervillain when he says he finally had control over his own life, and then gets upset when he has to face the consequences of being a supervillain. Not to mention, he's the one who let himself be peer pressured by the other leaguers. He's the one who put himself in this situation, and he needs to take responsibility for his own actions. They didn't even pressure him that much. He gave in almost immediately, but he could have pressed them on it. He could have actually taken control of his own life and focused on his sobriety instead of trying to annoy the Justice League. So why is he blaming superheroes for dragging him into this? That was his choice. And then there's the twins who just aren't allowed to be characters. Jaina is basically the mouthpiece the writer uses to force his opinions and politics into the story. And Xan is basically comic relief. More of a punchline, really. Where can they really go from here? As far as the moral of the story, there's nothing wrong with talking about prison reform. It's just that we take issue with the way he's going about it. In fact, other superhero stories have raised similar questions. There was an episode of Batman the Animated Series that asked if Batman was responsible for creating these supervillains and if his vigilanteism was the right way to go. 
Still, even you have to admit, Batman's come through now and then. But look at the lunatic fringe he's created. The Joker, Two-Face, Poison Ivy, and the rest. Batman's responsible for every one of them. It's ironic that the comic keeps insisting that they have to work within the rules of Earth, considering the fact that as vigilantes, they're constantly breaking the law. The art's also not very good either. It's not very consistent from panel to panel. For example, in the League of Annoyance, Praying Mantis's M disappears in one panel. Also, Beast Boy doesn't really look like a teenager. He has such a strong jaw. Plus, a lot of the characters seem to have same face syndrome. But that's just our opinion. It's really disappointing that DC let politics control this story instead of letting the story speak for itself. It could have been really fun and interesting, but instead it's preachy and boring, not to mention cringy, and confuses its morals a lot. At least Thunderlust wasn't brought up in this issue. Hopefully it won't be for the rest of the series, because we don't need that. But what do you guys think? We'd love to hear from you. Have you been keeping up with comics, or have the politics gotten a little too preachy. Thanks for watching everyone. If you liked this video, you can subscribe to our channel to see more videos from us. We make content about cartoons and comic books. You can also hit the bell to get notifications from us. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye guys. Bye everyone.